Good morning, and thank you very much to the more than 1,800 participants who logged in to be part of this very important event. Your interest and commitment show us how relevant this is for our region. It's an honor to be here with you in this space where we are trying to reimagine poverty solutions in Latin America and the Caribbean. Poverty continues to be one of the greatest challenges in our region, and understanding it from various perspectives, can we generate a significant change? This is especially important for development banks as an example to understand where to better focus our operations and resources. Our distinguished guests are connected all over the world. We could start by Minister Wellington Diaz, Minister for Social Development in Brazil and former governor of the state of Bauit, who's leading the Alliance Against Poverty and Hunger in G20, promoting policies towards a more equal development. Sabina Alkire here in New York. She's director at Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative Office at University of Oxford and is very well known for her work. Jeffrey Sachs, he's a well known uh, economist and professor in Columbia. Um, he's recognized for his contributions in economic and sustainable development and publications and advisory to governments and international organizations. We also have Luis Felipe Lopez Calvas, currently Global Director for Poverty and Equity at the World Bank, and he has broad experience at the World Bank and UNPD, where he has focused his work on an inequality and human development. I would also like to highlight the presence for Michel Mouchet, as Assistant Secretary General and Regional Director for Latin America and the Caribbean at UNDP. She will be moderating the session together with Sergio Diaz Granados, Executive President at CAF. So I am convinced that this conversation will allow us to generate new ideas and strategies to move forward on a mission to reduce poverty and build a more inclusive and equal future for our region. With no further ado, I give the floor to Michelle so that she can start the conversation. Thank you very much, dear Alejandra. Good morning to all of you. A very special greeting to our dear partner and friend, Sergio Díaz Granados, Executive President with CAF, the Development Bank of Latin America and the Caribbean, and the extraordinary panelists who have, you have already introduced, and clearly they need no further introduction in this conversation. Minister Wellington Diaz, Professor Sachs, my dear Sabina, dear Luis Felipe, it's an honor for us to have a space here to jointly think about this. This is a critical time for development, a critical time for Latin America and the Caribbean democracies, and of course, critical time for reducing poverty in our region and in the world. World. And for the almost 2,000 people who have joined us here today, whom I also like to warmly greet, having your experience, your wisdom, and your vision allows us all to comply with the purpose of this event, which is to collectively reimagine those poverty solutions within a very particular context of Latin America and the Caribbean. And this context in the region could be described as a time where our human development and our democracies are under a lot of pressure. That pressure makes decades of social progress and democratic consolidation that has been achieved for so long be at stake. And they are at stake even before such a brutal phenomenon as was the pandemic in our region where we already saw some setbacks in that progress in terms of poverty reduction and consolidation in human development and the quality of our own democracies. And the pandemic proved us, proven us, and uh, talking about poverty, many things apart from those losses, many of those could not be um, recovered it showed us that we are very vulnerable as a region, that our vulnerability continues to be a structural challenge, which is fundamental in order to move forward in building more inclusive, more sustainable societies and more resilient societies, and of course, more democratic ones. And there are many pressure points that are 
over democracies and over human development. Some of them are structural as deep uh, inequalities in Latin America and the Caribbean. Latin America continues to be the most unequal place in the planet, the low productivity, informality, but these pressure points are being interlinked with new trends that we observe in the region. Some of them could be seen as opportunities in order to uh, enhance human development and reduction of poverty, but these opportunities won't become such by themselves. They demand efforts from the public policy and also public uh, decisions that will transform them into opportunities. And these pressure points have to do with the eruption of new technologies, the uh, advancement of AI, but also the exponential increase of migration flows in Latin America and the Caribbean in a disorganized and forced manner in many other cases. Also, the worrying uh, progress of uh, organized crime, though growth being the developing region, the one that has the lowest development for 2024 and projections for 2025 continue to be really low. Climate crisis, we are one of the most vulnerable regions to the climate change impacts, particularly small island states and countries in the Caribbean in a disproportionate manner. And we cannot forget about the time that we are going through a global polarization time very much marked in Latin America and the Caribbean. And behind all of these challenges, some way or another, we have poverty as an underlying cause, which is also um, worsened by all of these pressure points I've mentioned before. However, in the case of Latin America and the Caribbean, the pressure we have to go through can also be observed as an opportunity and almost as a privilege, let's say, because this pressure somehow comes from constant growth for many decades. This is a pressure that comes, and if we focus on poverty reduction, Latin America and the Caribbean has been a pioneer in previous decades uh, from the efforts by the end of the 70s and 80s with basic unmet needs and the awareness that development and social policies could not only be based on metrics by income and then also efforts to develop monetary transfer programs where Mexico and Brazil were pioneers not only in the region but also an example that was later replicated elsewhere in the planet that achieved an important result in terms of poverty reduction and also after OFI and UMPD launch in 2010, the, pover the multidimensional poverty index. This is a region where most countries adopted this uh, global vision and adapted to their needs and uh, national context to use it as a tool to guide public policy. So this is a region that has proven a capacity to innovate, to look for solutions in terms of public policy, always that they have had that uh, leadership behind it. But within the current context, more of the same thing won't be enough. So that's why we have this event. That's why CAF and UNPD decide to join efforts in opening a space that will allow us to reimagine those solutions that are are adapted to the current context, understanding that without reducing and putting an end to poverty, it will be very difficult to think that sustainable development be feasible and that the strengthening of our democracies will be a happening. Sabrina and I have published an opinion article not long ago where we asked where poverty was because there are a series of priorities in terms of development that seem to compete among themselves when in fact they are interlinked and it's essential to bring this discussion about poverty to the center of the debate because this is the only way when we will have a support in public decisions in order to address this effectively. And we are convinced both CAF and UNPD, OFI and the World Bank, as well as Professor Sachs, through all of his publications and uh, Brazil's leadership as well, that this is possible. But we need to find mechanisms in order to try to get to the speed and rate and scale that are being demanded by today's challenges. But if Latin America and the Caribbean have been pioneers at one point, we are sure that they can do it again. The idea is to see how, what is it that we need to do in order to achieve this, not only in terms of dignity, right, and opportunities that all Latin Americans and Caribbean people deserve in the region, but also to see how we can support in a more interdependent world and see how to support solutions to 
to other places in the world, how we can better support decision makers in order to connect these objectives to reduce poverty with some other priorities that also exert a pressure on decision makers. How can we generate more efficiencies considering the low economic growth that is being estimated and also the indebtedness levels of countries where efficiency and efficacy are of particular importance? And how can we facilitate and promote the construction of consensus that will allow us to address problems that are transporter, that it's not enough with the action of one or another state, but we, of course, need a global vision, but in this constant a regional one that will allow poverty reductions to become a priority in the agendas and better understand what type of tools can be necessary if we need any additional tools, what type of capabilities we need to develop in decision makers and uh, public uh, policy makers in order to translate this into tangible results and these questions that we don't uh, are, we are not looking for a specific answer but these are questions that are important in reimagining these poverty solutions together with all of you and with all of our partners and um, guests. So as UNDP this is natural, this is essential not only as um, how we are moving forward, UNDP was born 60 years ago as a leader agency in development. To put an end to poverty, and we can talk further about that, Sabina, with a universal presence that allows us to connect what happens within the region, but among the region and some other parts of a planet. And right now, we are in a time where we want to build over that legacy in the last 60 years, the legacy that involves the introduction of the concept of human development, multidimensional poverty, its translation in applied politics in order to look towards the future and build the next generation of public policies and leaderships that are really necessary in order to uh, accomplish the step that are being uh, demanded by today's challenges. Why with CAP, we complement each other. The executive president has already talked about this several times. We both have mandates and objectives that are complemented with each other. We both recognize also due to our own experience, the value and the weight of public policy and of good policy in order to address challenges that we have. And find ultimately, we all trust that we do have challenges, but we have even more ch uh, opportunities and uh, that's why we are here today. So, Alejandra, I go back to you, uh, reiterating my greetings to all of those who have joined us, who are part of this collective reflection, and inviting you all to share your reflections through the different media available. And I'm ready to get into this discussion with the rest of the panelists. Thank you, Ale. Thank you very much, Michelle. Your reflections were quite relevant. I think it will help each of those to talk about the aspects and the visions of each of our panelists. I would like to give the floor now to our president, Sergio Diaz Granado, so he can make the introductory remarks and also talk about the reflections from the uh, CAF perspective. Just want to greet you all. Good morning, good afternoon, whatever you are, especially those who are joining us remotely, and especially thank Michelle, who has been our valuable counterpart in this very important partnership. Michelle, thank you so much for your leadership. It's a great honor to also have the support of Alejandro Botero, my colleague, as a moderator today. She's also um, a planning manager for CAF, and this is a reform that we've done in the last three years at the bank to try to understand everything that we are doing and see how we can better measure the impact on development for this institution. This event also reflects the strategic partnership between CAF and UNPD, as Michelle mentioned, reasserting our commitment to reduce poverty in Latin America and the Caribbean. Poverty continues to be in one of the most urgent challenges in our regions. In 2022, 180 million people 
people live in poverty lines in Latin America, according to ECLAC. If we don't make our best, we won't comply with the first objective, uh, which is to eradicate poverty in 2030. That's why it's very important to explore new strategies and innovative uh, approaches that will respond to the realities of our communities. We are also honored to have uh, Sabina and the panel you have in New York, Luis Felipe Lopez Calva, my good friend, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, and also having the Minister of Development in Brazil, Mr. Wellington Diaz, uh, who will probably enrich today's discussions. You will help us reflect about two very important problems, how to overcome daily difficulties that have to be experienced by a million people in the region, and your recommendations to close the gap to comply with the SDGs. And of course, it will also allow us to better describe the role of development banks, its governance, and how to address new challenges. The proposal of uh, President Lula, I saw that firsthand in the UN very recently to create a global partnership against hunger and poverty that also is led by Minister Wellington Diaz is maybe one of the most important initiatives that has been launched this year. There's no doubt that hunger and poverty continues to be one of the most critical and persistent challenges faced by our region by humanity, and they demand it. A comprehensive and interconnected solutions. Let me also take this opportunity to announce our formal adhesion to an alliance. Uh, CAF is the first financial institution to formally adhere to the global partnership against hunger and poverty. So we are committed to promoting not, not only specific programs and activities in the region, but also tailor-made solutions, financial services, technical assistance, among others, in order to face these challenges. Let me also very briefly go to the reason of our discussion, because eradicating poverty is at the core of everything we do in CAF. Just three reflections about today. First, we need to check the dynamism and the effectiveness of our public policies in key sectors as housing, water, health, education, or the labor market that are fundamental to address poverty. In our report we conducted at the bank in 2022 called Inherited Inequalities, it talked about inequality in Latin America that's been inherited from the cradle. It's transmitted from one generation to the next and has a skin color. In Latin America, we are almost global experts in making solutions that worsen our problems, being the case of housing. For almost 10 years, we've been having a growing deficit in housing in Latin America and the Caribbean. The situation of water it's also very important. More than 100 million Latin Americans lack of safe access to water. Many people in 2024 in urban areas have had no access to sewage services. Almost 60% of urban wastewaters have haven't got the adequate treatment. And as a development bank, we are focused on developing programs that address all of these things that uh, have an incidence in poverty. I'm in Madrid in the Water Dialogues, an annual activity that we've been conducting for almost 10 years today. We announced the operation, uh, a very important operation for the case of Salvador, uh, an activity of almost $10 million, uh, $100 million, and this will allow Salvador to create a special protection vehicle for its basin that produces not only water for rural water in Salvador, but also for the population of the capital city. And this is maybe one of the first operations have that has been done over a river. And basically, it's the protection of a water border that will guarantee the supply to the Salvador populations. Today, we've been reviewing data on employment, and it's dramatic to see how today we have 30 million young people in Latin America who neither work nor study. That's the big deficit in Latin America, a deficit of hope in a young people, a deficit of hope. 30 million young people that are at all times um, victims of criminal groups. Today, I was reviewing with a good friend of the Minister of Development in Brazil, with the Secretary General of uh, Pajo, Jaime Barbosa, the health situation in Latin America and the Caribbean. 
only for dengue we have 7 million cases that have been reported in the continent. It is estimated between 5 and 10 times the number of cases of dengue in the region that consume working hours per year and reduce dynamism to the labor market. We need more productivity, more employment, and health epidemics are uh, costing a lot in terms of effectiveness. So several of these sectors and policies need to be fine-tuned and reviewed, like health, education, housing, drinking water, just to quote some of them. Second, second message, we need to have solutions through local governments and also dynamize the private sector. And Professor Sachs will understand what I'm talking about. We need to speed up governors and mayors as part of the solutions to poverty problems. Working with the city is crucial. Latin America has 80% of its citizens in cities. So we need to work closer with them. In CAF, we are making innovative products in order to work directly with mayors, with governors, in order to provide regional solutions, but based on local solutions. We've created a network of over 185 cities in Latin American Caribbean to work with them directly. So we need more guarantees, more previsibility in order to find the solutions. Third message to focus our uh, on uh, target populations. Let me greet Oscar Gamboa, a very good friend, who also joined the seminar. We need to understand the causes of uh, Afro-descendants and indigenous populations in the regions. The big paradox is that these populations are in a um, weak environmental area in Latin America and the Caribbean, and this is where poverty lies the most. So we need to work on poverty policies and environmental policies. We have millions of people in the Pacific, in the Amazonia area, in the Caribbean that are under poverty situations that are living in areas of higher ecological and environmental impact. And there is a need for progress that it's also putting pressure on environmental resources. So the event we hold today is the first landmark of our partnership in cooperating with UNPD around poverty and together with OFI, the World Bank and ICLAC, we are are developing multidimensional metrics on poverty and providing the necessary tools to countries in order to design much more effective public policies. We want to also make use to the next meetings, the COP16 and the Summit of Development in Salavija and COP30. These are big opportunities in the next 18 months and also the G20 in Brazil this year. We have four figures that are really important, four meetings that are really important this year. We need to make the most in order to continue to push towards reforms in the system that will allow us to give more support and capacity to those institutions that are working towards achieving the SDGs. Uh, I mentioned this a month ago and I repeat it. We need a big surgery of our global financial in infrastructure and put the banks to the service of the urgent needs of the planet. And this implies at least to have more coordination, more effectiveness among us all. Let's move forward convinced that joining our efforts we will be able to build a more prosperous region in the case of Latin America and the Caribbean, a more just and prosperous region. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Diaz Granados, for your remarks. Let me now introduce each of our panelists. Each has a very unique perspective that will help in this debate, and it will be interesting to talk about this topics that Michelle mentioned about the need of UNPD uh, in the role in Latin America. Um, of course, President diaz Ganado's remarks about what should be the role of development banks that we are seeing in Latin America. What are the challenges around environmental vulnerability, the financial system, and also specific sectors that we should use our resources on in order to focus on eradicating poverty. So I would like to begin with the Minister of Social Development in Brazil, Minister Wellington Diaz. Thank you so much for being with us. Minister has a record uh, dedicated in 
public service. He's been leading significant efforts to reduce poverty as, for example, the Partnership Against Hunger and Poverty as part of the G20. He has also been had some, uh, he has been governor of Piaui, uh, developing social programs with a positive impact in millions of people, especially in challenges such as food insecurity and access to basic services. Up next, I would also like to welcome Professor Sabine Alkide, a British economist, very well known internationally for focusing on measuring poverty. As a director of Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative Office, Sabine has developed a methodologies offering a more comprehensive and complete view on the privation, the privations that people have to suffer that are instrumental in order to develop public policies that are focused and we've seen very interesting results in the region. Sabina has promoted the idea that poverty is a multidimensional phenomena that goes beyond lack of income and has cooperated with several countries and international organizations in order to implement these tools that allows to develop more effective public policies, including a broad history in Latin America. Would also like to welcome Professor Jeffrey Sachs. He's a very well-known economist and an academist with broad experience in sustainable development. He has given advice to several governments and international entities in the formulation of strategies to fight poverty and in promoting an equal economic development. His comprehensive approach, we will see later on, addresses not only economic aspects, but also environmental and social aspects. Professor Sachs is well known for his capacity to translate global challenges into practical and collaborative solutions, just as uh, president uh, was also saying about seeing the perspective from local cities and governments leading initiatives that are trying to mobilize uh, different resources to face problems such as extreme poverty and climate change. His uh, word has allowed to see for more holistic approaches in sustainable development. We also have the presence of Luis Felipe Calva, uh, a special uh, Mexican economist who is the Global Director for Poverty and Equity at the World Bank. Luis Felipe has developed key roles in international organizations. His experience has been fundamental to analyze and propose solutions to the social economic gaps in Latin America and the Caribbean and other regions. Luis Felipe has emphasized the importance of social and economic inclusion as a pillar for development. His research and recommendations have helped several organizations to implement policies that do not only promote economic growth for our regions, but also guarantee that benefits will arrive to the most vulnerable sectors in society. So let's move on with the discussion in order to move forward. Thank you, Alejandra. Welcome again to all of the speakers. We will now begin with Minister Wellington Diaz from Brazil. Welcome once again, Minister. In the introductory remarks, I refer to the pressure that we experience in Latin America and the Caribbean right now. And this is a pressure where decision makers really have a place. So reimagining poverty solutions might seem like an attractive exercise for many of us who are connected here today, but this is a particular challenge for decision makers today. I had the experience in the past of being a Minister of Social Development with a different context, with different uh, challenges at that time. We still discuss whether poverty was multidimensional or not. Today we recognize but today we have to face a series of different challenges. And we will begin with the political dimension. As you know, in this event, we are trying to see how we can uh, approach policy with public policy and the tools that we have available to have a um, stronger impact on the terrain. And we were saying that we were capable of having great progress. I think that Brazil is one of the first countries that come to mind as an extraordinary achievement in terms of reducing poverty. But also, we think about Brazil as a good example when we say that more of the same is not enough. Minister you have long history in this field. I think Brazil is one of the first countries, as I said before, that comes to mind.
So my question is, what are the implications in the context of Latin America and the Caribbean do you see for this partnership and how can we apply this to the countries in the region in order to learn from Brazil's experience and make the partnership be translated into tangible results? Minister, you have the floor. Let me first of all greet you and the whole UNDP team and also congratulate you on all of the work done at the summit and the General Assembly in New York. We had a chance to talk about the importance of this time that we are experiencing on the one hand together with the G20 with for the global partnership against poverty and hunger. But in November, after this, we also have the commitment of most developed countries to help developing countries. And the various organizations that are involved in or that are participating in the UN and work towards sustainable development objectives, uh, goals, sorry. The main point is to address goal one and two and some other goals that have also been proposed. So let me greet all of the teams that are involved in Rome, Madrid, New York, where this Saturday I will be part in Rome of some of the events also, let me greet Washington and thank Alejandra and all the work done by CAF through Sergio Diaz. Let me thank you for CAF position that is being integrated to this working group consolidating a global partnership against hunger and poverty. Let me thank as well Sabrina, Sabina, who manifested about this very important position. Also Jeffrey. Anyway, all participants. So from the Brazilian point of view, when we see a world scale of food insecurity. And that's our benchman, benchmark, according to FAO. Also in the Brazilian scale, in terms of food security, and this is a little bit broader in 2022, after Brazil moved from out of the uh, hunger map, there were 33 million 100 people within food security area and we had our bolsa familia or our family uh, bags and a series of policies that president lula decided to include within their budget and within the policy around 75 billion dollars were invested in different policies in regards education etc and all of this combined to obtain results you know 24.4 million people that were rich in 2023 and now we have a strategy in order to reach in 2024 new goals here we have an 8.7 million brazilians goal. We work on the unique uh, social assistance system, also food security system, and all of this combined with uh, health and education. And we also want to close the year with around four and a half million people who were uh, within the food insecurity area and we want to bring them within this protection network to give you a general view according to files criterion 2023 we close with 2.8 the average is in 3.9 
And when we separate that year only, it's 2.8% in 2023. That is to say, we're working so that in 2024, we will be able to have around 2, 2.2, and reach around 2.5%. That is to say, that will allow us for 2024 sorry, 2025 to reach, uh, reach progress and guarantee a po positive three years. So apart from a food acquisition program, President Lula this week authorized the expansion in more than 300 solidary manifestations. I mean, the most important thing is to uh, comply with goals. But apart from this, Brazil is also working so that these people can also uh, live poverty in general terms. In this sense, there is a robust program in terms of education so that these people can access work. People who are within Bolsa Familia plan, a large uh, percentage of active population and also public and private sector are working jointly here in order to generate employment, in order to uh, favor entrepreneurship. Brazil has economic growth. And here we have a vision. If we don't assist them, then chances will go by. And you can see two positive results when we see the new work contracts and admissions between 2023 and 2024, we already have 15 million people accumulated. And these people are included within Bolsa Familia plan who have celebrated already working contracts. So we are talking about the fact that it is possible to uh, take them out of extreme poverty through work and that these people can also overcome poverty. Over 400,000 people have increased their income this month and therefore they've been able to exit the line of poverty. If they lost their jobs, they will go back to the protection network. But the point is clear. The idea is to help them change their social status in this sense. Lula will launch a new program, which is called Acredita. This means uh, believe in Portuguese. And it refers to a series of business that are aimed at this because we want to create a fund. And for instance, uh, small businesses want to create a business. Okay, they will have a guarantee fund there that guarantees low interest rates and the proper deadlines with a technical assistance. <clears throat> And in the sense, in one year time after being launched, we would like to reach around 1 million new entrepreneurs that are, are uh, living poverty through entrepreneurship. We already have several success cases in this sense. And by 2026, we would like to have credits for 36 billion in order to guarantee all of it. So ultimately, in November, we'd like to have the approval by the partnership and guarantee a maximum of countries participating within organizations in order to guarantee that we will have the conditions of a strong support by most developed countries and in this sense also guarantee a coalition that will allow countries to comply or to achieve a national plan, of course, there is a 
platform of proposals under that and this should also be supported by organizations for instance CAF or Oxford. We have a maximum amount of organizations that are also being involved in order to guarantee based on that and not only with a financial support but also the necessary expertise and the necessary technologies to guarantee that developing countries will be able to overcome poverty and hunger as well. So in this sense, you can count on Brazil. We will be part of it with our plan Brazil without hunger, Brazil sin hambre, that has already been launched. Also, the uh, poverty plan also allows us to reach the lowest poverty indicator in our stories in terms of inequality, the same thing. So we would like to contribute and share all of this with other countries. That's why in this conference, UNDP and CAF on Latin America and our challenges, I think that Latin America, the Caribbean, Africa are regions with countries that will be able to share all of this experience in order to reach better results. So I'd like to thank you for this important privilege of being part of it. You can count on us, you can count on Brazil, not only in terms of approval of the partnership, but also in a priority manner to work together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Listening to you and seeing how it was possible to Brazil, thanks to the leadership of President Lula and your leadership as a minister, to translate the political vision, the political commitment to the highest level in order to generate a sustainability and connect several public policies in order to generate that sustainability in eradicating poverty is really remarkable. And in this discussion about how to reimagine those solutions, listening to you is a source of hope that the region has capable leaderships to go back on track facing the challenges that we have today, but also leaderships that are aware that these are not exclusive challenges from one single country. We should see this with a broader outlook. And for that, we will have your participation in the Ministerial Forum on Development that we jointly held between UNDP and ECLAC. That will be uh, held by the end of the month, an excellent opportunity to share this experience with other ministers in the region. Before leaving you, because I know you will are, have a busy agenda, I would like to repeat my uh, thanks in order to build together with Sabina many of the solutions that we are trying to build. And together with Sabina, Ofi two years ago started an um, executive education program for decision makers, for public and political leaders, and also public policy makers of a top level. And we've been discussing about holding this program for executive education focus on Latin America and the Caribbean countries next year. And this is something that we will continue to discuss with ministers as part of the forum. So if you could share, Minister, from your own experience and the leadership that you are having, what are those competences that are key in order to develop in decision makers and policy makers? to better support them in their efforts to accelerate a reduction of poverty in their countries. Having presence with different teams that are in each of the municipalities at every corner of Brazil, having a socialist system, social assistance system and food security system all of that integrated and also a set of policies. This is the thesis uh, advocated by President Lula that hunger and poverty are integrated with some other needs. Sometimes we may have an income, but the value or the amount that we spend in rent might consume this income. That's why it should be integrated with a housing policy. The cost of family spending, of uh, energy, medication, so there is a need 
for a policy that will address all of this comprehensively. On the other hand, I think it's also important to consider that it's not just income transfer. What helps someone leave poverty and hunger is the fact of it being healthy, of having an opportunity for education to raise their children during the first years of life, to have a professional qualification, to guarantee access to employment, to guarantee sustainability. Otherwise, for many years, we will make that person dependent on another thing. So we should give a step forward. That's what we are doing in Brazil. Here we have an income transfer that is comprehensive, as is Bolsa Familia for 26 million families approximately, and it was reduced now to 18 million families. So we want to reach in 2026 a further reduction as we guarantee and we are able to guarantee uh, food, then they are more autonomous in order to give further steps. So in this experience is where we are open in order to contribute with other countries, you can count on Brazil. I think there's a lot of opportunities to learn from this comprehensive plan of importance of localization, also multidimensionality of poverty, the importance also of considering income, but not just income, but also connected with those dimensions of well-being that are important for people in their lives and also the concept of agency which is also central to the idea of human development and what we are looking with this policy is that people are free enough to choose the life they want to live and the also the means and opportunities to do so thank you so much minister See you in Barbados at the end of the month to continue with the conversation together with some other regional authorities. Now, I would like to continue with another guest, Luis Felipe López Calva. As you were saying, Alejandra, Luis Felipe has brought history in our region in everything that has to do with inequality, poverty, labor markets. And Luferipe, you were regional director of UNDP at a time when I was on the opposite side of a government uh, trying to solve and trying to look for alternatives. And as I said before, this was a different context. And I remember very well that at that time, there was close uh, support in order to measure poverty in a different way. And there was important support and something that was a priority at that time to guarantee the continuity of efforts and governance was an important element of our work right then. Then you led some other efforts that also gave important results amid the pandemic, in the case of Honduras, for instance, using these tools in order to guide public policies that could give an answer to the population. But in a recent publication of a World Bank, it is clear that this is a different context. And this publication is based on the word polycrisis. Eight or 10 years ago, the concept of polycrisis was not so present in our minds, in the experience that we are all undergoing. And in this World Bank report, it tries to connect poverty, prosperity, and planets. And I would like to invite you to reflect on reimagining solutions and going beyond what we've already tried. To what are the new pathways that are being suggested by this report? And how do you see Latin America and the Caribbean from this global stance that you now have within that global scenario in terms of possibility to move forward in these new pathways that are being suggested by the report that has just been published by the World Bank? Yeah, Felipe, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Michelle, greetings to all of you. It's an honor to be part of this discussion. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Sergio de Granados from CAF. 
and greetings also to Alejandra Batero, Sabina, Jeff. It's an honor to be in this conversation. Let me say that I admire very much Sergio and Michelle, and I thank you very much. I prepared my presentation in English, so I'll now switch language. I know there are simultaneous interpretations, so thank you so much and congratulations for this cooperation and event. What I would like to say, first of all, is a global outlook and then go towards Latin America and the Caribbean, which is the region that we address today. Thank you so much for talking about global poverty. Today is the International Poverty Day after Resolution 1992 on the UN. So we had a chance and Jeff also generously participated from this event two days ago. We were able to launch our global report where we first of all talk I mean, this is the first comprehensive uh, um, report that combines poverty, inequality, and a livable planet. And we talk about this polycrisis, this group of shocks that are overlapping and that have affected the world, and also the Latin American region. So these are our pathways out of the poly crisis this is the report but let me also show you another report that is also launched today for the latin american and caribbean region by mr castrigiana that and I will specifically talk about the region in global terms the most important message as you know is that we are out of pathway in order to uh, comply with SDG ones. Here we have poverty rate, two point fifteen dollars per person. But if you see the middle income line, you can also see that approximately forty percent of the population will be poor, and that is also applying to Latin America. Now we'll talk about Latin America in terms of conversion. We can see that there is an improvement since 1999 but there is a drop in the convergence rate this also worries us and in terms of inequality we could also observe that the number of countries with a high inequality has gone down but is still concentrated in latin america and sub-saharan africa so in this global context we'll go straight to latin america and the caribbean with this regional report that is being introduced today a good news is that the lac region has seen a progressive uh, recovery after the pandemic i'm going to talk about challenges and opportunities the last figure for lac shows the low lowest figure, in fact, the lowest uh, share in poverty, close to 25%. So one out of four people in Latin America are still poor with less than $6.85. Uh, this is good news, but at the same time, there's an excess of poverty compared to income. The recovery after the pandemic of a middle class, you can see here, but there's a good a share of population that is under vulnerability and then i'm going to talk specifically about vulnerability if i have the chance it's so important to mention this and i'm going to get into the main message here of what the global and regional report says the conditions of the labor market are fundamental to reduce poverty in a sustainable manner as you can see here the labor market in terms of uh uh, profit and the proportion of population participating in the labor market is in fact the main contribution. You can see here negative numbers. The contribution to changes in poverty is mainly boosted by the conditions of the labor market. However, public transfer continue to have an important role. So we cannot underemphasize the importance of continue to have this social protection programs that will complement the income of families. Uh, so this drivers in short-term achievements will not be strong enough to gain momentum in our missions to eradicate pro pro poverty. I would like you to see this chart because this is about the incidence 
the growth incidence. Um, and in the first part of the recovery, you can see that the recovery was quite progressive. Those who were down were growing faster, but this is flattened and then even further. So the recovery was less progressive in time and the projections in terms of poverty reduction are quite modest. It's important even more uh, we talk about multidimensionality of all of these measures. So the idea that uh, job quality continues to be low and that they show no big improvement. In fact, the idea here is that while the recovery of salaries and employment is clear after the pandemic, this is not the case for quality and this particularly happens with men and structurally you can see that women participate in lower quality jobs all of these aspects led us to think that it is really very important to continue to support public transfers and social protection programs but also creating conditions so that labor markets work better so that there are less people in informal jobs and have more quality jobs. And this is what will take us ultimately to a faster recovery in terms of reducing poverty. So improving job quality, also investing in skills, investing in digital technologies in such a way that this will allow more people to be economically active and of course bring a gender perspective. These would be my four main messages uh, that uh, this report in Latin America and the Caribbean tries to emphasize. I think we can further talk about vulnerability if there's a chance to do it, but I think it's important to say that on the one hand we have good news and on the other there are also some challenges that are more structural and we need to be ready for that. Thank you, Luis Felipe, for those reflections. They were very specific recommendations and somehow these are connected quite well. Last year, a report, a global report was launched also talking about SDGs and speaking about the type of policies that were to be implemented in order to go back on track. And this demands more than a trade-off to see how to connect synergies between various targets and of course skills and quality in jobs digital technologies and gender became part of this analysis too so i think that this is a very clear reflection and if we have the time i would like to address vulnerabilities considering that one of the structural changes in the region is not just poverty per se but how vulnerable we are before poverty. So now we'll continue with our next meeting, Professor Sachs, uh, next guest, Professor Sachs. Uh, Professor Sachs, you had a very relevant role in very important intergovernmental processes that led to agreements such as the 2030 agenda as you all know today would be impossible to imagine that level of consensus around this objectives around these challenges that we also need to face worldwide. You've given advice to several secretary generals in the UN and you've also given your support. But at the same time, one of the strongest voices on the need to reform many of these institutions, including the UN. As you stated in the last report, that was also launched in 2024, a couple of weeks ago here in New York, 193 countries, which is an important figure in terms of the polarization that we are experiencing, agreed the pact of the future. And the pact of the future recognizes poverty again as a main challenge to achieve peace and sustainability in the world. And they've all been committed to strengthen their efforts to eradicate poverty. So I would like you to reflect with us about how do you see these main intergovernmental processes within the context of Latin America and the Caribbean? What is the role of the region in order to translate all of these commitments into tangible policies and a tangible action and how we can connect 
intergovernmental processes. We will soon have three COPs in less than six weeks. And we will also have COP30 next year in the region as well. And we also have a fourth conference on funding for development in 2025 and a summit on social uh, development. So all of these challenges, uh, sorry, all of these commitments are for decision makers and governments themselves. So how can we better support and make the most of these opportunities in order to translate these high level commitments into tangible results within the particular context of Latin America and the Caribbean as part of the rest of the world? Professor Sachs, you have the floor. Thank you so much for being with us. It is a great pleasure to be with all of you and also a pleasure to be able to listen to all of these initiatives from Brazil. That will be great contribution. Also the contribution by COP and the UN system. I have a specific point because I agree with everything that has been said, but I would like to emphasize that we won't have better jobs, we won't have a higher income unless education is not only present, but it's a quality education and the children really learn at the level it should be. I would refer about PISA rankings and where Latin America stands in this PISA rankings. PISA, of course, is uh, the program of educational international student uh, achievements that is kind of a reference around 80 countries and their educational results. Results uh, specifically are for children uh, 15 years old in reading, science, and maths. And the situation in Latin America is not good. Of course, it's in the middle of the rest of the world, but in fact, it's not the level that will achieve progress in terms of job quality or economic growth. If you see those who rank first among the countries participating from PISA, they are all from the uh, from Asia, one, two, three, four, five, six, all Asian countries, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong, China, which is not the whole country, but just Shanghai and Beijing. One to six. So where is Brazil? In 2022 ranking, it ranks 66 in math, 63 in reading, and 62 in science. There are some other countries in the region that have lower levels. Now, in PISA, the poorest countries, they're not even present. So, basically, there are very few low-income countries that would have a lower rate ranking it's not that or lower score it's not that this is a terrible situation but this situation should improve even further because we can not only see rankings but also the real scores and scores in this exams are among 300 when in fact they should be between 500 in order to have an actual global competitiveness. So we know that Latin America is highly unequal. Uh, almost in any country, there is a great intergenerational transmission of human capital. Rich families that convey higher levels of education and future gains to their children than more than poorer families in many countries, education is basically privatized for the richer areas with higher um, levels. And the poor sector gives basic education, but not the type of education that will lead to towards dynamic growth or towards growth opportunities for the youth. I believe that this is a big difference 
between Eastern Asian and Latin America in the last 40 years. 40 years ago, Latin America outpaced Asian countries in terms of income. We know it was four decades of a lot of stagnation in per capita income in Latin America. This has been four decades of very fast per capita growth in Eastern Asia countries, not just talking about China or high income countries, but I'm talking about more general terms in Vietnam, for instance, they've also had incredible success and many other countries as well. So I think that strength in education is really a big part of it. The focus on technologies updates and having a local population that is well equipped in order to adapt themselves to change in technologies to meet local needs and the capacity of being part of the main supply chains, not just in terms of manufacturing, is very much based on skills and also on quality of education. So I believe that this is a big difference. Another big difference is that Eastern countries invested strongly in science and technology at a national level. They created programs, uh, national science foundations, where they empowered universities to be able to support startups and also be part of supply global supply chains. I don't feel that this is dynamic by far within the Latin American context. Not everything is a negative thing. There have been a lot of progress, a lot of breakthroughs and technological sophistication in several sectors and in various areas of the region in Latin America and the Caribbean. And there's also been an important reduction of poverty, of course. So it's not just a sad story at all. But if we are to achieve a progress needed by Latin America, then we need to overcome this trap of a middle income. This is a trap that basically has to do with a threshold in science education. And Latin America can overcome that trap, but has not yet done so. The difference between middle income and high income is the huge capacity in terms of STEMs. So, I would like to uh, ratify everything that has been said. I don't disagree with any of that, but I think that uh, performance should be better. We need to better understand why quality is not where it should be. In part, it has to do with investing in each children, of course, the social context is not just the level of spending, but there's also a social component in place. But I think that the goal should be clear. We need to measure PISA scores, we need to have a benchmark, and we need to strongly invest in new digital technologies and in the scientific capacity in order to adopt those technologies in the different sectors in Latin America has everything they need to do it. It's quite consistent with social agenda as well, but I think that this is the added component. And now let me also emphasize on the fact that multilateral development banks should play a more important role. They need to provide a financial space in order to comply with that role, to play that role. In fact, we need more long-term funding in order to achieve this improvement in the quality of infrastructure of education, also scientific and technological capabilities. It's worth uh, borrowing to do this if it's within the terms of the World Bank, if this is a 30-year deadline with really complex uh, loans and high interest rates, CAF and the Development Inter-American Bank and the World Bank combined should boost their portfolios for the region, for the Latin American region. Of course, this depends on the preparedness of owners in order to work 
in this sense, but returns on investments will be huge. I'll stop here. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of it. In fact, I need to run now because I have another event. This one began a little bit late, so I have another event in Rome. Thank you so much for allowing me to participate. Thank you, Professor Sachs, for your remarks and for including education also here and also innovation and uh, digital science, which are is critical. And the last point about how to finance or fund. We all know that in the region, in many developing countries, we have some cases where the cost of debt is higher than investment done by governments in education. So the way in which we can be creative today while we continue to speak about how to reform financial architecture, but doing this today will be critical. And maybe in the next discussion, Professor Sachs, we'll need to see how, I mean, Latin America and the Caribbean have, have needs previously in terms of uh, the debt relief, but we are uh, running risk of losing a race. And this is an open question because this is just the beginning of a discussion to reimagine what we have done and what can be changed. And maybe we may talk about this later on in a formal manner. Thank you, Professor Sachs, and the best for you in your mission in Rome. Thank you so much. It is good to be with all of you. Thank you now. We will continue with Sabina. Sabina Offi and UNDP have been working hand in hand since 2010 in the publication of this report on multidimensional poverty globally. This year, the focus is on the relationship between multidimensional poverty and conflict. And for those of you joining us, I invite you to read an opinion paper that was launched and that was written between Sabina and Juan Manuel Santos from Colombia about this relationship between poverty, conflict, and peace. And we go back to the discussion we are having. This is not just policy or measurement. There is a po political decision behind President Santos led some important uh, processes to reduce poverty and to build peace. And I wanted to invite you, Savina, to think with us, even though this is a global report and a context where there are multiple armed conflicts in the world right now that provide a lot of material to be analyzed. Latin America and the Caribbean, while they don't face an armed conflict per se, continues to be the most violent region in the planet with the highest amount of murders per capita in the world and one of the main threats to human development and to democracies in the region being a region with a democratic vacation despite the imperfection of its democracies. Organized crime represents an important challenge. So how do you see these reflections about this connection between poverty and conflicts, but specifically the exit pathways based on public policies in order to address this interconnected phenomenon that is mentioned in this report? Sabina, well, it's a uh, Pleasure to have you here sharing your reflections with us firsthand. It's also a pleasure to be here with you, with the panelists, with all of those who are present here today. Today, the International Day of uh, Poverty Eradication will launch this global report, including uh, MPI on acute poverty. And this report includes 6.3 billion people, 113 countries, and many of them are poor. And 40% of these, 455 million people, live in context of a conflict, maybe war, fragility, very low levels of peace. So their lives are quite complex complex already with multidimensional poverty, but they also lack many other things. And it, we add conflict and this context. So the report tries to analyze globally the various contexts 
But specifically, what I believe is that in situations of conflict, for instance, uh, war, 34.8 over one third of the society is poor. And in situations without conflict is 10.4. So the level of poverty is much higher, of course, there are differences among countries, but it's stronger than we thought. And this is not just at a national level, but all, in, in all of the cases, this is higher, for instance, between children who are not going to school, 4% 4, 4 have some, lack something. But in situations of conflict, this is 17.7. .7. In terms of need, 5.6% of the population are poor and they don't have uh, electricity, for instance. But in the situation of conflict, of war, it's 26.9%. So there are very strong inequalities that we have poverty on the one hand and also situations of conflict of lack of peace, etc. So there's no solution, but just as the report states, we need to recognize the context and evaluate both things and other pressures, as you said, in terms of climate change, in terms of political tension, and we need to try to find a solution for both. What I was really moved about was the suggestion to put at the center of the debate monetary poverty and all of these. And how can we do this? Each student, maybe, who's looking for education might know and be confident about levels of poverty in their country. Maybe they understand what this is all about and what we can do as a member of an NGO, as a member of a government or the private sector. How can we help and contribute? And now in Latin America, as we know, there are like 13 countries that have a multinational, multidimensional poverty index. So I cannot compare it to India, but each of them has its own context. So these are as, uh, the numbers in Brazil, as was mentioned by the minister, they would be different from uh, Barbados, for instance. And so uh, this we need to announce all of this internationally. We need to see this in the different levels of government and in press. Specifically, in order to celebrate reductions when we have that. And this might be a future step. Some countries already have this. Some countries already see trends every year and make the updates. But in order to communicate this, at a more general level, this would be good. And the most important thing is to be able to recognize success. For instance, if there is a strong reduction in Chile, for instance, we should see whether problems have been solved or not. Minister Wellington Diaz talked about this important program uh, at a regional level or at a local level. The same thing could happen in Panama the in, or for indigenous groups or afro descendant groups or many other poor sectors in many countries. But we need to understand the instruments, maybe a nutrition program for children at schools that can solve the problem of malnutrition and have also assistance and give women different places to prepare food. So there are many questions 
that we can try to ask in order to solve all this because poverty is something that can be solved. If it's on the table, if we are all thinking about what to be, what to do as an institution or as a group, this is something that uh, can be solved. And our hope is that we can make part of it. Uh, what's an MPI? An MPI, as if you don't know, well, you know that you have many needs in terms of food security, nutrition, water, education, work, informality, etc. But if I'm a poor person, many times my life is being affected by multiple needs at the same time. So instead of having many statistics, MPI aims at analyzing the set of uh, needs suffered by the person at the same time and recognize a person as a poor person if they have critical needs. So with this measurement, we will be able to see at a national level a figure we can also classify by various groups and regions but we can also see the composition of multidimensional poverty between south north uh, the indigenous people etc so uh, this can also be a tool to design public policies for ministries for governments for different regions and population groups so our hope is that right now in Latin America, that already has a history of facing unmet basic needs, we may also have another leadership uh, and be pioneers in reducing poverty and have it with this situation with fiscal and strong fiscal limits. And let me close with the example of Costa Rica. When they launched their MPI, they recognized that there were many indicators there and many times there was more investor investment in less poor sectors. Uh, the, there were different presidential decrees and they were able to see an acceleration in poverty reduction even though uh, resources did not increase. And I think that we need this case study, we need hope, we need wisdom to see how we can use what we have in order to reduce poverty. The suggestion of putting it at the center of the debate, at the center of the table, in order to engage in it is something that I really appreciate a lot. Thank you, Savina. Very good findings between the relationship between conflict and poverty. This is sometimes devastating in many of these conversations when we talk about metrics and numbers and percentages. We cannot overlook that behind all of these discussions, we have human lines that are suffering and we have a very limited possibility of self-developing and help the development of our societies. The good thing is that this is an exercise, the global MPI, that is not only analyzed, but is being offered in order to take a direction. And I think we have a space also with decision makers, and we will also have them at the ministerial forum, and we will talk about how we can build different steps. And we have a different proportion of countries that have these tools. And this can be connected with some other uh, public policies, priorities, as long as we have poverty reduction at the core of it. We are almost at the end, but I would like to make a question, which is mandatory, Luis Felipe, and we had it at the end of your intervention, something you've also been uh, working on. And maybe you could all share a reflection about that vulnerability to poverty in Latin America and the Caribbean. We've achieved quite a lot in a relatively short period of time, but it's quite vulnerable. So those vulnerabilities, how can we better support that in order to uh, address them and identify it. And this is the core of the next uh, regional forum that you're both contributing to. So 
remark about this point, and Luis Felipe would been discussing this, so I think it would be good to uh, listen to you. Thank you. I'll be very brief for a matter of time. So first, let me say that we focus, and I call the attention, and I hope you can all see the regional update for Latin America and the Caribbean, that is with our global report. So the concept of livable planet in the World Bank's vision is not just a climate, it's more than that. That's why I like the fact that you mentioned this and that Sabina also talked about uh, conflict and fragility because the concept of livable planet is a broad concept that includes vulnerabilities for different types of shocks and risk. We have a global indicator, and let me close with this, where we address, and we are now talking with leaders of the multidimensional uh, readings, PNUD and uh, UNPD and OFI, and I know that you're working uh, also with CAF, but we've also adopted a multidimensional approach in many aspects in multidimensionality. We have uh, also multidimensional indicator that sees exposure and also the capacity to respond, to answer to those potential shocks and the, your interaction defines vulnerability. I know that UNDP and Almudena Fernandez is working on a broad concept of vulnerability. Ours is quite specific to four types of climate shocks. Uh, what we find globally, one out of five people worldwide are in high risk of being poor based on um, climate shock in Latin America and the Caribbean, our estimation is around 90 million people who are exposed to go in uh, to the poverty line due to climate shocks. Not only they are exposed, but they also don't have the capacity to respond. And that's where investments in various dimensions make sense. They talked about infrastructure, uh, service delivery, uh, social protection services, etc. So we believe that in order to reduce poverty successfully, not only in terms of structure and uh, generating income for countries, but it's also important to have a capacity to be protected before these shocks and reducing vulnerability. In this case, I mentioned uh, shocks related to climate, but as we'll see further on in your work, vulnerability is a much broader concept. Once again, thank you so much, Michelle, CAF, PNU, uh, UMPD, Alejandra, and Sergio for making me part of this discussion. Thank you, Luis Felipe. I think that there are certain points in the agenda to continue with this conversation at some other time. A vulnerability, a risk management seems to be an important part together with education and how we finance all these investments. That is to say, this reimagining of solution starts but is extended in time with a sense of urgency because what's behind really deserves it. I would like to thank you all to thank all of our speakers and span panelists for this wonderful conversation. I go back to you, Alejandra, so that you can conclude this discussion. Thank you, Marcela. This has been fascinating. And plus, I love it that we did it on this day, which is such an important day for the world, and we'll put in the agenda poverty reduction as a priority. Some of the challenges and structural challenges that we have, equality, prosperity, and how we now need to add a series of new challenges as, for example, migration, as, for instance, the perspective and vulnerability, uh, climate change, uh, global polarization. And I think that in all of these reflections from our various experts also help us to uh, feed the second dimension that we need in order to target on poverty as a priority. Also, with the fiscal restrictions we have, with the challenges in terms of growth, and I think this perspective of looking at the risks that are uh, transnational, like, for example, crime and migration are so important. And this is an effort that we can make at each of countries and also in, in, as a region. So that combined with a perspective mentioned by Luis Felipe and also Sergio, how to prioritize in certain sectors as development banks in house and water in uh, 
perspectives with uh, specific vulnerable uh, populations as ethnic populations, Afro-descendants, and that gender perspective that is so fundamental. And I think that helps them focus. And this is one of the wonders of a multidimensional tools that have already been developed for several decades. And we have the honor of having Sabina here with her remarks as well in that regard. Another important aspect here, also mentioned by De Felipe, has to do with the new instruments and the rules of the games for the multilateral bank and for multilateral organizations. I think that scenarios will be present and if for the next 12 months are fundamental in order to see how we can expand those spaces, also flexibilize the rules of the games and also support countries in that transition. Some key points, it was really very interesting to listen to Minister Diaz with this second interaction after the success of Bolsa Familia plan and to see how this combines with the perspective of agency, with the perspective of uh, income generation and with the interrelation between uh, policy. I remember in Colombia and the NDP uh, making that poverty table with all sectors around it was something that was fundamental in order to have an effective reduction. Le Felipe with uh, emphasizing specifically on quality of work and the skills needed in order to have a leap in uh, employment generation, also digital technologies you've also mentioned, and gender perspective is fundamental. And that connected with a very um, specific vision of Professor Sachs relating to education, education and skills. So if we focus uh, on that, something that we need and it must be a priority and that relation that you also mentioned. First, we should invest in education, but we should invest in education. That should be first combined with the exercise of expanding the space for development banks in order to support that. And finally, Sabina, I agree with Michelle, those statistics about difference between a conflict and non-conflict and the difference in opportunities is something really very important. I think we'll all read that report and see how we can incorporate and prioritize elements as, for example, conflict within the vision of poverty and also the reflection of seeing this multidimensionality so that we all understand what are the specificities of each country and how we can support ourselves as a region and countries in order to achieve them. So we have this partnership and this work that will be done with the World Bank, OFI, and let's hope with Professor Sachs. This will all be at your disposal in order to delve into this agenda that is still now being envisioned, and we hope that in the next few months and years we can support them in, gen in similar activities. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Michelle, for this excellent moderation and reflection. Thank you, Alejandra. Thank you all for being with us, and we will continue with this discussion. Thank you.